In this video, I want to talk about how to actually derive a Gibbs sampling routine for an arbitrary circumstance. So the first step to deriving a Gibbs sampler is to write down the joint probability distribution. Remember that Gibbs sampling requires us, however, to know the conditional probability distributions. In this two-dimensional example, we need to know the probability density of x given y and y given x. So how do we find those? Well, generally what we do is we use the conditional law of probability. So the probability of x given y is given by the joint distribution of x and y divided through by the probability density of y. However, notice that this density is defined with respect to x. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we integrate p of x given y with respect to x and we integrate across the entire range of x, say from minus infinity to plus infinity, then we get 1. And notice that the entirety of the x dependence in the conditional is given by the joint distribution, the numerator on the right hand side. So what does that mean? It, well, it means that the conditional probability density of x given y is proportional to the joint distribution of x and y. So how does this help us? Well, the idea is that the conditional distribution is essentially the joint distribution up to a constant of proportionality. Well, how does that help us? Well, the idea is that we can remove everything else on the right-hand side out of the joint, which doesn't involve x. And that gives us a functional dependence of the conditional distribution on x. And if we recognize the functional form of the dependence on x as being the same as that from a known distribution, then we know because the right-hand side must be a valid probability distribution, it actually must be that known distribution. So the idea is to derive a Gibbs sampler, we first of all find p of x given y, and we find it by taking the joint distribution and then removing all of the terms which don't involve x, and then looking to see if we recognize that functional dependence. We then do the same thing for y in this example. So we find the conditional distribution of y given x, as being again proportional to p of x and y. But then what we do is we remove everything in the right hand side which doesn't involve y. And then we look at the functional dependence of the right hand side and see if we recognize that distribution. If we recognize that distribution, say it looks like a normal, then it must be that the conditional is indeed a normal because it is a valid probability distribution. So the idea is after we've done this, then that gives us conditional distributions, which we may or may not be able to sample from. But nonetheless, this is a first step in deriving a Gibbs sampling routine. I feel like this process is best explained through use of an example. So the example I want to use now is, imagine that we have a load of experiments and in each of the experiments, what we do is we flip a coin n times where n is an unknown number, so it must be an integer, obviously. And we also suppose that the probability that the coin lands heads up is given by a parameter theta, which is also unknown. In each experiment, we then record the number of heads by a variable which I'm going to call xi. And so I'm going to refer to each experiment as the ith experiment. And then the idea is that we repeat the above process k times. And in each of the experiments, we flip the coin the same number of times n, and we're using the same coin, so it has the same probability of landing heads up. And so that gives us a sequence of x1, x2, all the way up to xk. And in this example, what I want us to do is, because n and k are unknown, we want to infer them. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a Gibbs sampling routine to allow us to do this inference. So the idea is that we have this vector of x values where each of the x's correspond to the number of heads which are thrown in each of the k experiments. And the first step to deriving a Gibbs sampler is we need to derive the joint distribution of n and theta conditional on x. And we know from Bayes' rule that this is given up to a constant of proportionality by the likelihood of x conditional on n and theta times the priors of n and theta. And in this example, we're going to assume that theta is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. 
and that n is given by a discrete uniform distribution, because n is obviously a discrete random variable, between 5 and 8. Because each of these uniform distributions don't contain any n or theta dependence, we can essentially forget about those for writing down the joint. So to find the joint up to a constant of proportionality, all we need to do is to be able to write down the likelihood. And the likelihood here is just given by, if we assume that the results on each of the experiments are independent of one another, then we need to take the product of the individual likelihoods. Then what we do is we assume that the results which we get across each of our n coin flips in one particular experiment are independent of one another, and under those circumstances a reasonable probability distribution to use is a binomial distribution. And that has a functional form given by the binomial factor nxi times theta to the power xi times 1 minus theta to the power n minus xi. Then we realise that we can actually simplify the two theta terms on the right hand side because theta to the power xi, if I take the product of all those xi terms, just becomes theta times the sum of xi. And then we get 1 minus theta to the power of the sum of n minus xi. And the sum here is going from i equals 1 to k in both cases. And then we have another term which is the product from i equals 1 to k of the binomial factors n, xi. And this term, to me, doesn't have an obvious simplification, although I may be wrong. However, it doesn't really matter here. Then we can simplify each of the theta terms a bit more if we want to, it just makes it a bit more compact to write down. So then we get theta to the power k times x bar, where x bar is the sample average, times one minus theta to the power nk minus k x bar times this product term here from i equals 1 to k of n x i. So this is an expression for our joint density up to a constant of proportionality. Now what we want to do is we want to derive each of the conditional densities. Then what we do is we follow the rule that I described before. So to find the conditional density of theta where we condition on n and x, what we do is we remove all the terms on the right hand side which don't contain theta. So we just get left with theta to the power k x bar times 1 minus theta to the power nk minus k x bar. So up to a constant of proportionality, this is what the conditional density looks like for theta. And what we do now is we recognise that this actually has the form of a beta density, which makes sense because we used a beta density for the prior. We used a uniform random variable between 0 and 1, which is the same as a beta 1, 1 distribution. And because we used a binomial likelihood, our posterior here for theta should also be a beta distribution because of the conjugacy property. But nonetheless, we can just see it here from our functional form. And we recognise that this is a beta density with first input k x bar plus 1, which is the first power plus 1. And then the second input is also going to be the second power plus 1. So then I'm just going to factorise the second term. We get k m minus x bar plus 1. So this is the conditional density of theta. And then what we do is we try to work out the conditional distribution of n where we condition on theta and x. To do that, we remove all of the terms on the right-hand side of our joint density that don't involve n. And so what we get here is we can remove the first term here, which is theta to the power k x bar, and we can also remove the 1 minus theta term, which has got the k x bar in it as well, because we can write that as the product of two factors. And so what we get left with is that the conditional density is given by 1 minus theta to the power n k times the product from i equals 1 to k of this binomial factor n x i. So what sort of distribution is it? Well, it's some sort of odd discrete distribution, which doesn't have a functional form which is particularly familiar. But all is not lost because of the fact that we only have four terms to worry about for this discrete distribution. There is the value of the distribution when n is equal to 5, 6, 7 and 8. We've only got these four values because we used a discrete uniform distribution between 5 and 8. So what we can do is we can compute the value of this distribution, this probability mass function, for each of these different values of n. Then we can sum them up and we can use it to normalise the individual probabilities of each of these values of n. 
Then, essentially what we end up doing is we are drawing from a categorical distribution. And a categorical distribution, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is basically a multivariate Bernoulli distribution. Here we're going to be drawing once from one of these four categories. And because we're just going to be doing this drawing once, that means that we have a categorical distribution rather than a multinomial. So how do we go about actually doing Gibbs sampling given that we've now derived our conditional distributions? Well, the idea is much like any other MZMZ algorithm. We start off by sampling some values of theta and n from some arbitrary starting distribution which has appropriate support. Then what we do is we iteratively sample theta conditional on the previous value of n. Then we sample a value of n conditioned on that recent value of theta that we've just sampled. And we iterate both of these steps many, many times. And finally, because I'm now going to use an applied example, I want to show the data that we're actually using. So the data samples that we have are the numbers of heads being two in the first experiment, four in the next one, three, 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 then two, then another two threes, and then two fours. So we have 10 experiments in total. And so we see here that the minimum number of times that I must be throwing the coin is four, but I've already specified a discrete uniform distribution between five and eight, so we are already discounting four as a possibility. Now I want to show you some simulations that I've made in Mathematica. So here along the horizontal axis, I'm depicting n, the number of times that I flip the coin, and the vertical axis here depicts theta, the probability that the coin lands heads up. And I'm assuming that we start off in some random location in parameter space. In fact, I think I've just deterministically specified that we start at a value of m, which is 5, and theta, which is 0.5. And so what we're going to do is we're going to draw a value of theta from the beta density, which I've shown over here on the right-hand side. And this beta density is going to change dependent on the value of n, which we have. So I draw a value of theta, and remember, in Gibbs sampling, we always accept that value, so we will move to that new location. And then what we do is we draw a value of n from its conditional distribution. And remember, it's this discrete distribution between 5 and 8. And so I can calculate the conditional distribution, and it turns out to look something like that, which I've drawn above here. And so now we draw a value of n from that conditional distribution, and unsurprisingly, we stay where we were because the highest probability corresponds to n being equal to 5. Then we repeat this process. So now we draw a value of theta using our conditional density for theta. We draw that and we move a little bit. And then we draw a value of n again, draw that. We then draw another value of theta. And now because our value of theta has changed significantly, our conditional distribution for n has changed quite a lot. So now we draw a value of n and we just keep repeating this process. And if I just leave this to play, you can see how we're gonna iterate between each of these two steps. So what we're doing in one step, we're updating in the vertical direction, which corresponds to theta, and then in the next step, we're updating in the horizontal direction, which corresponds to n. Then if I allow this process to move on at a sort of faster rate, we can start to see the shape of the joint distribution which we're drawing from. And so what do we see here? We see that there is some sort of negative correlation between n and theta. And as we let the simulation run more and more, we see that we either have a high value of theta and a low value of n, or vice versa. And that makes perfect sense because there are two ways to achieve the same number of heads on a given throw. Either we throw the coin more often and it has a lower probability of turning heads up, or we throw the coin fewer times, but it has a higher probability of heads. And so if I leave this to run much, much longer, you will see that we actually get a kind of general downward sloping distribution here, representing this negative correlation in the posterior between n, the number of times we throw the coin, and theta, the probability of the coin landing heads up. So in summary, to derive a Gibbs sampling routine, this requires us to know the conditionals. The best way of determining the conditionals is writing out an expression for the joint density and then removing the respective other terms of the joint which don't correspond to the particular variable whose conditional density you're taking. You then look at the functional form of each of those right-hand sides and see if they correspond to known densities. If they do, then that's easy because most computers have inbuilt pseudo-random number generators for common densities. If they don't, you'll need to think of some innovative way of drawing values from that density.
And because of some of this difficulty of actually having to know the conditional distribution, this actually provided a motivation for Radford Neal to create what is known as slice sampling which is kind of a way of almost doing Gibbs sampling even when you don't know the conditional distributions. 